In our very first jointly published article some 40 years ago, Dave Talbot emphasized the theoretical scientific importance of anomalous mythological motifs. Quote, Ancient statements appearing to contradict elementary experience or logic are a key to discovery. End of quote. The ancient testimony and artwork surrounding the divine thunderbolt is anomalous from A to Z and impossible to square with present reality. Far from being a fairy tale deriving from our ancestors' experience of a terrestrial thunderstorm, the thunderbolt was a heaven-spanning structure of awe-inspiring splendor and stupendous power, one which likely endured for generations and played a pivotal role in all ancient mythologies. Creation itself, according to numerous traditional accounts of the event, traced to the primordial coupling of a thunderbolt and the mother goddess. Thanks to numerous variations upon this globally attested mytheme, the catastrophic events in question can be reconstructed in great detail, shedding much light on the historical evolution of the polar configuration and the thunderbolt's manifold forms. Perhaps the most famous example of this archetypal mythological theme is the lurid tale told by Euripides in the opening lines of the Bacchae, wherein Zeus couples with Simile in the form of a fiery thunderbolt. Quote, Simile brought to bed by the lightning fire, end of quote. According to Greek tradition, the thunderbolt not only impregnated the maiden, thereby producing Dionysus, it killed her instantly. Now here is a most peculiar idea. In what sense is it possible to understand a thunderbolt as an impregnating or fertilizing force? A vestigial remnant of this archaic myth theme is evident in the legendary stories that grew up around Alexander the Great. In Plutarch's Life of Alexander, the conniving Olympias, the Macedonian general's mother, is said to have been visited by a thunderbolt on the eve of her wedding night. Quote, the night before the consummation of their marriage, she dreamed that there was a crash of thunder, that her womb was struck by a thunderbolt, and that there followed a blinding flash from which a great sheet of flame blazed up and spread far and wide before it finally died away. Strange as it must seem to modern readers, analogous traditions will be found around the globe. The Norse thunder god Thor, much like Zeus, was celebrated for his prodigious powers of fertility. Thus it is that Thor's thunderbolt, Mjolnir, served as a fructifying talisman, hence the famous passage in the Eddic poem Thrym's Song, wherein it is stated, quote, Bring the hammer the bride to wed, place Mjolnir in the maiden's lap. As Helga Davidson documented in her Compendium of Norse Lore, such ideas hark back to ancient conceptions of the thunderbolt as impregnor or fecundator, survivals of which persisted well into modern times. Thor himself was frequently invoked at weddings, the god's thunderbolt forming a familiar accoutrement of many a bridegroom's attire. Quote, In certain parts of Norway and Sweden, it continued to be the custom for a bridegroom to bear an axe at the wedding long after Thor was forgotten. The weapon was said to give him mastery and also to ensure a fruitful union. It will be noted that Thor's thunderbolt was here conceptualized as an axe rather than a hammer. Very similar ideas are attested in ancient Lithuania, where Perkunas' thunderbolt axes were commonly regarded as agents promoting fertility. Quote, in Lithuania, the axe is a life-stimulating symbol, is laid under the bed of a woman in labor, or the sill to be crossed by the newlywed couple. During sowing, axes were thrown into the field. End of quote. Here, too, it is obvious that no farmer in his right mind would ever view the fiery thunderbolt as a life-stimulating talisman, hence the profound puzzle presented by these widespread belief systems. Analogous conceptions are to be found already in ancient India. Witness the following hymn from the Rig Veda dedicated to the thunder god Parjana. Quote, the winds blow forth, the lightning bolts fly, the plants shoot up, the sun swells. Refreshment arises for all creation when Paryanya aids the earth with his semen. Paryana, come nearby with this thundering, pour down the waters as the Lord, our Father. Roar, thunder, set an embryo. Here the thunder god is implored to inseminate Mother Earth and implant an embryo in her womb. Perhaps the earliest attested example of this archetypal motif is to be found in Spell 148 from the Egyptian coffin text, circa 2000 BC. There it is reported that the thunderbolt or meteor fell from heaven and impregnated Isis. 
The fall of the thunderbolt resulted in Horus being implanted within its mother's womb. Quote, Isis wakes pregnant with the seed of her brother Osiris, end of quote, i.e. Horus himself, the soon-to-be king of the gods. To return to the question posed at the outset of this inquiry, how is it possible to understand the ancient tradition of the thunderbolt as impregnar, or fertilizing agent? One can search the world's corpus of scholarly books devoted to ancient myth and never find even the first glimmerings of an answer to this question. Horace's identification with the planet Mars provides the all-important clue. As I have documented elsewhere, Mars is everywhere identified as a meteor-like object that fell from heaven. The Babylonian god Nurgle, for example, expressly identified with the red planet, was invoked as Miket Ishatu, denoting the fall of fire from heaven. Equally telling is the fact that the same phrase was employed to describe lightning or meteor. Analogous conceptions were associated with the planet Mars in the New World, where the Skiddy Pawnee explicitly likened the morning star to a falling meteor. Quote, now they sang of the origin of the morning star itself that they thought had come from a meteor, end of quote. The same basic idea is evident in the Skiddy belief that, quote, the power of the morning star is the fire-impelling stone. We know the Skiddy morning star was explicitly identified with the planet Mars. Granted that Mars was indeed conceptualized as a meteor-like celestial body by indigenous peoples around the globe, how does this finding help us understand the archaic and seemingly universal belief system whereby a thunderbolt meteor impregnated Venus and thereby sparked creation? According to the historical reconstruction offered here, the myth in question encodes the close approach of the planet Mars to Venus during one of the most spectacular phases of the polar configuration. Moving from outside the general vicinity of Venus, the red planet seemed to fall like a meteor into the center of Venus. In reality, Mars was then on an orbit between Venus and the Earth and appeared like a tiny orb in Venus's belly. Looking up from Earth, Mars appeared to be nestled within the body of Venus. As the red planet appeared to enter the visual outlines of the much larger Venus, it was conceptualized as impregnating it, or alternatively, as implanting an embryo within the mother goddess's womb. Hence we would understand the Egyptian tradition of a heaven-sent thunderbolt impregnating Isis Venus. The Vedic tradition of the thunder god Paryana implanting an embryo in the belly of the mother goddess finds a similar explanation. So too we would understand the mythological role of Thor's thunderbolt as a fertilizing force or as located within the mother goddess's belly. Such traditions encode the extraordinary conjunction of Mars and Venus, the sacred marriage that sparked creation. It goes without saying that the planetary scenario outlined by Dave Talbot and myself requires that Mars formerly appeared in front of Venus, an impossibility in the present sky, whereupon the red planet always moves on an outer orbit far removed from Venus. Yet as we have emphasized again and again throughout this series of videos, it is these so-called impossible situations that are the key to discovery as they would never occur to terrestrial sky watchers around the globe without the stimulus provided by the natural events reconstructed here. And the fact that Mars's placement within Venus is impossible given the current arrangement of the solar system actually serves to make the reconstructed planetary configuration the decisive test case in evaluating the predictive power of the present historical reconstruction against that postulated by orthodox science. We rest our case, confident that our understanding of recent Earth history will be vindicated in the coming decades.